afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our first tokenomics masterclass with Kartik Ear. Thank you all so much for being here, and we're really looking forward to this uh, afternoon and evening of great learning, especially during this time where we know many of the serious players are left uh, in the ecosystem, uh, including ourselves. So a couple of quick words about Longhash. Longhash is a global blockchain incubator, and we also have a data media platform. In Singapore, we're support, supported by the government through Enterprise Singapore, and we are also in Shanghai, Tokyo, Hong Kong, Berlin, and Zug. So if you're looking for incubation, our next batch is going to start uh, somewhere in May or so, and uh, we can also help projects to gain presence in Asia. Now, today we're very honored and grateful to have one of our great mentors, Kartik Iyer, come and share his great insight. Uh, so please put your hands together. Thank you very much. Yes, I think so. I think uh, we're going to have a more interactive uh, introduction session, right, as opposed to, <laughs> to the typical. Absolutely. And, and by the way, you know, I changed my mind halfway through. I thought the tokenomics would be boring. So I have a series of memes uh, on the other presentations. Those who want tokenomics, maybe next, next time. Yes. Yeah. So. <laughs> yes. I mean, I'm surprised as well as uh, hearing that, you know, last year the token tokenomics masterclass was fully sold out. So I thought, you know, people would be more interested, but I'm sure it'd be even more spiced up with the memes. <laughs> Well, absolutely. I mean, it was 120 people. It was sold out in uh, two days. Uh, last year, it was at SunTech. Um, and I'm happy to be doing this. You know, I think it's interesting for the community. It's interesting for, you know, the researchers and for the academics. So I think there's a lot of value in it. Uh, and, you know, um, so. Yes, and we're very privileged to have you here as a really real veteran in the blockchain space. You know, all the way since the beginning, I understand that you're an ambassador of the P2B Foundation which um, um, perhaps some of us might not be that familiar with, but you know, I'm sure you can share more about all the way from the beginning, right? So I think a lot of people in the crypto world do not know what the P2P Foundation is. Uh, so if you Google Satoshi Nakamoto on your phone right now, the first link is a Wikipedia link. And Wikipedia will tell you the only place Satoshi has a website today is the P2P Foundation. So that's where he published the white paper, that's where he published the first Bitcoin client. So everything started from there. And uh, I don't know if you want to call it karma. Uh, <laughs> I was doing my PhD at the University of Oslo uh, as a member of the P2P Foundation. So it is fascinating to see how this uh, space had evolved. You know, you, I and Sikai used to talk about the old days. You know, in 2008, uh, there was really nothing happening in the Bitcoin world <laughs> because there was no Bitcoin client. In 2009, uh, exactly uh, 10 days from now, it was uh, 10 years anniversary of the first Bitcoin client. So those days, uh, there were hardly anybody. There's only researchers, there's only academics, all the boring people. So today you go to a crypto event, you would never find a technology person or economics person. It'll be makeup artists, beauticians, models, right? So it's almost impossible to find a technology or an economics, econo economic uh, person. So those were the old days, right? And, and so, um, so it's fascinating to see how this whole space has evolved. And, uh, you know, I, th I think it's uh, it's been interesting to to be uh, you know a, a tourist uh, in this journey. I mean, to see how this has evolved. Uh, so. Indeed, and uh, in fact, one of the most fascinating developments recently will be the securities token offering, which everyone is talking about, and I'm sure we're all very excited to hear more about. I also wanted to highlight, like you mentioned, sometimes it's a bit like karma, right? You know, putting the right things in the right place at the right time, where Bitcoin perhaps was putting together decentralized technology along with aspects of finance and also kind of game theory. And you also happen to be, you know, in the right place, in having kind of exposure to all these different aspects throughout your life. No, absolutely. The world was falling apart in uh, 2008, 2009, right? Financial crises, uh, Lehman Brothers collapse, uh, the Greek financial crises. So I was doing my MBA when the, we were actually looking at the news <laughs> and studying some of these things and analyzing. And after my MBA, it was my PhD. And during my PhD is when, you know, I started you know, being actively involved in this. Uh, it, I didn't understand any of this stuff initially. I mean, it took me a while to, you know, grasp it. And when you're mining Bitcoins in 2009, 2010, there was really no value. So nobody took it seriously. It was more like, you know, uh, just geeks playing around with technology. I mean, that's what it was. And then the first Bitcoin exchange came in 2011, Mt. Gox. And you've seen my first trade in Mt. Gox. 10 Bitcoins for $8.6, 86 cents a Bitcoin. And that's when Bitcoins really had value. And, uh, and then, you know, Litecoin came, you know, J.R. Willard did his, 
ICO, which was called Omni MasterCoin. So ICOs became a mechanism for raising money. Uh, we did the first ICO from India, Wandex, you know, for one of the first from Singapore Amber, the first from Finland Soma, first from Canada, Dub Tokens. We did some of the first ICOs almost, you know, like pretty much in every major G20 country. And, uh, and it's been interesting, I mean, to see how, you know, the space has completely transformed uh, fundraising. Yes, indeed. And of course, we're looking to tap into your expertise as well, not just from the technology aspect, which you're very familiar with, and also the peer-to-peer -peer aspect from your PDB Foundation, and of course, the economic experience as well from MBA from Fudan. Well, thank you very much. I hope I don't, uh, you know, I'll keep more exciting means coming the yes. way. And, uh, <laughs> All right. So please put your hands together for Kartik Ear. Well, thank you very much. Uh, no, I'm very impressed to see a full, almost full room on a working day, a Monday afternoon at three o'clock, and uh, and I think almost 60% of the people here are friends of mine, so it's almost like uh, talking to family. <laughs> so, so, so thanks for coming. And uh, so, I conducted this class last year, almost exactly one year ago, uh, 11 months ago, not one year. This was a Suntec. Uh, the you know the class was sold out in two days. And uh, how many of you were in the class, my previous tokenomics class? Was anybody there? It's fascinating, right? I mean, everybody who did an ICO has now gone back to work because their tokens have gone to zero. So, so, <laughs> you know, so I don't know if it was my tokenomics or their technology, but we'll find out. We'll find out before the end of the, uh, end of the session. So, you know, it's almost the same day, right? It was 27th February, now it's 28th of January, almost, uh, it's again karma, right? I mean, it's just sort of everything aligning. Um, seems like I don't have any slides. <laughs> Is it, <laughs> do we have something there? Uh, I thought I put some slides together. Uh, Okay. Yes. All right. Fabulous. Okay, so what we are going to talk about today is, uh, so last year it was only tokenomics, right? It was only utility tokens. And 90% uh, of them uh, who came to the class, uh, you know, are either working for coffee shops or have found real employment uh, in order the crypto space. So, yeah, I mean, you know, it doesn't feel like real employment, right? When you're in the crypto space, everybody's traveling around, going to conferences, hardly working, right? Or working hard, uh, depends on whether you're the founder or the COO. Um, but, um, but you know, so this time it's, I've expanded it uh, to tokenomics, which will talk about utility tokens, and then uh, protocol level tokens, right? So like Ethereum, the foundations are very different. And, and then security token offering. So the pioneer in Singapore in security token offering is here. Is Jonathan here? Yes. He's in the last bench. I think he's going to rag me sitting there. He's the first person. Please stand up, Jonathan. He's the, first, the pioneer in Singapore. So he's here. Jules uh, Corporation. So, so I was glad to be involved with Jonathan. It was a great opportunity to, to you know, see that through. Um, so, you know, before, before we start, you know, I mean, I like storytelling, right? Because these are complex ideas, game theory, econometric modeling. Uh, you know, valuing us and so on. So one of the things I realized when I was doing my PhD, when I was teaching a master's course is that people remember stories because stories are powerful. So I'll start with a story. So the game of chess was invented in India, right? And there was a, a monk who actually invented, so this is saying that there's a monk who invented it. It's not the blockchain monk, it is a real monk. You know, the blockchain monk's job is just running around. Uh, so the real monk, you know, he invented it and it became very powerful, right? A lot of people started using the game, they were playing the game, and it, it, it went viral. In today's terms, you'd call it going viral, right? Everybody was playing the game, the king was happy, the kingdom was happy. So, the king invited this monk and told the monk, I'll give you whatever you want. 
because you've you know invented something that makes everybody happy and it's a beautiful game. So the monk said, I have very simple needs. You know, I'm the monk. So what I need is this board of chess has 64 squares. So what I want you to do is something very simple. Give me one single you know, iota of rice for the first square, multiply that into the second, multiply that into the third, multiply that into the fourth, and so on for 64 squares, right? So you have one iota of rice, the second square is two, and then it's two square, which is four, and then it's four square, which is 16, and it's 16 square, and so on and so forth. So the king went back, you know, three weeks later, his minister of finance came and said, we cannot, you know, we cannot satisfy the needs of the monk because if you actually compute the total number of grains, how much is that? 18 what? 18 what? <laughs> Anybody wants to take a guess what that is? Sorry? Quintillion. Quadrillion, quintillion, right? Bill trillion, quadrillion, quintillion. 18 quintillion grains of rice, which will take a couple of centuries for that king to produce in his field, right? So below is the mathematical model. It's a, a geometric series of how this is done. So just like the king, a lot of us do tokenomic models where we create tokens. And uh, a lot of those tokens end up trading below the offer price, get delisted, because we do not understand the magnitude of what we're trying to do, right? What you're trying to do is you're creating your own money. You're just not putting your face on it. That's what you're essentially trying to do, right? <clears throat> so tokenomics is the art and science of meaningfully modeling your own economies, your own microeconomies. Because in essence, that's what you're trying to create. You're creating your own money, right? So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk about these different aspects of tokenomics. I mean, what is, what is this thing? You know, uh, how do we approach it? Um, because 30 to 40% of the white papers we see are copy-paste from other tokenomics models, right? If you go and ask somebody, how did you arrive at this number? 50 million tokens or 100 million tokens. And you typically get the answer, the number sounds nice. <laughs> so the number sounds nice. It's a good number to start with, right? So when you create your own economy, right, you want to become like the monk, not like the king, right? So, and to become like the monk, you need to have those, those reasoning abilities. So crypto economics is a convergence of finance, network security, game theory, we'll get deep into it, right? Law and regulation, economics, distributed computers, behavioral economics, how do people behave in a network? Because with blockchain, what you're doing is that you're moving the power from the institution to the network, right? It's almost like the French Revolution for computers. You're democratizing decision making to the network. So you want actors to behave in a rational way. And so crypto economics is about rationalizing behavior through economic incentives, right? So, of course, and the cryptographic ecosystem, you create an entire ecosystem around it. What is a token? So we want to get from the basics, right? We need to understand the difference between a token and a coin and, uh, you know, uh, and, and so on. So what is a token? Before we model the economics of a token, we need to understand what a token is. Definitions are very important, right? So anybody wants to take a guess of what a definition is? Representative, okay, good, very good. So this is a very interactive session, right? Because it's right after lunch, maybe one, two hours after lunch. You know, it's a nice, uh, <laughs> and every, all the shutters are down. It's AC, so it's nice to draw away. So it'll be an interactive session. So the token is a representation of value. Yes, okay, good. What else is a token? Sorry? Medium of exchange, yes. Tokens are medium of exchange as well. But within the ecosystem, which it relies in. Oil of, the Oil of the ecosystem, exactly, exactly. It makes the thing, so all these answers are right. 
So this is the, the classical definition that is used in a lot of different places, right? A unit of value that an organization creates to self-govern its business model. There's a big difference between a token and a coin, and we will get into it. Before we model the economics of these different ecosystems, we need to understand what this is. So unit of value that an organization creates, so what you're doing is you're creating your own business model. Instead of providing equity to somebody, you're printing your own money, and that money goes up in value, right? So it's a new way of organizing your business activity. It's a new business model. So, and, and empowers its users to interact with its products while facilitating the distribution and sharing of rewards and benefits. You cannot provide economic incentives directly like dividends, but what you can do is you can incentivize good behavior by providing tokens, right? What is the difference between a coin and a token? What is the difference? And there's no, no wrong answer, right? So what's the fundamental difference between a coin and a token? Yes. 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 Right. Exactly, right? So a coin is basically, uh, it's used to pay the transaction fees within a system, right? So the underlying tokenomics between a token and a coin is fundamentally different because a token is used to get access to an ecosystem, whereas a protocol, right, is, is a base layer thing. So you need to incentivize users to behave properly and so on and so forth. So a coin and a token are fundamentally different things. And the economic models for a coin and a token are also fundamentally different. So these are all tokens, right? So you can use a token, uh, you know, for buying Skype, you know, because if you buy a Skype token, you can only use it within the Skype ecosystem. You buy a bus pass, you can only use it within the transportation system. You understand where I'm getting to, right? A utility token is a token which can only be used within the ecosystem, and hence when you model the economic activity of the utility token, it will only be focused on the universe in which it, it remains. Are we all clear? Yes, no, maybe? Kinda, sorta? <clears throat> A token is a represent, it's an IOU, that's what it is, right? It represents rights and obligations. You can use it to trade with somebody, right? But it's fundamentally used to get access within an ecosystem. And once a token is issued, it represents some value. Okay, so I'm just going to the fundamentals before we go into the more advanced ideas. So there are three different types of e crypto economies that are out there, right? The first one is the cryptocurrencies themselves, the coins, right? So you pay the gas price or you pay incentives for the miners. So when you design an economic system for a cryptocurrency, it's fundamentally different because we are incentivizing good behavior or we are incentivizing good actors to share network resources. When you do a utility token, it's more to do with the exchange of value within an ecosystem. Right? So like for example, you have a dApp and you want to buy and sell stuff within a dApp. And third is crypto security. So I'm gonna talk about all three today. How do you value it? How do you model it? How do you, you know, make sure it doesn't blow up when it goes to uh, you know, trading in the markets? Right? So crypto securities is basically real estate, you know, some real world asset that you're securitizing on the blockchain. So how do you value it? It's fundamentally different from a utility token right? or, a, or a currency. So a token always has an issuer, right? So, and it has a substrate. A substrate is a, a carrier in which you, on top of which you build the token. Like Ethereum is a substrate, right? It has to have a system in which it's meaningful in. It has to have value for somebody, right? Somebody has to believe in your token, right? Or it cannot just be pump and dump. And it has to have some way to use them, right? It has to be exchangeable, tradable, and so on. So a token can be used as a store of payment, can be used as a unit of payment, can be used to pay fees, can eventually become a unit of account in itself, right? Can be traded, be identical, can be, I mean, fungibility, non-fungibility. So I'm going through the basics because some people are very advanced folks here, some people are somewhere in the middle, so, you know, I'm just starting out, you know, slowly, steadily. So can carry a payload, so I'll get into what a payload means can grant access or rights, be tied to other tokens, right? Like for example, people are doing airdrops now, 
in which the actual airdrop is only a discount for the actual token, right? When you do an airdrop, you don't have to actually airdrop your token. So I and Jeffrey were having a conversation about it. You don't have to actually do an airdrop of your token. So you could actually provide a discount contract on your actual token, which will give you access to the actual token. Like you can do a 15% discount, which you airdrop on the, on the uh, so how many people know what airdrops are? I mean, I see a lot of my friends here in the crypto world, but the non-crypto people. So airdrop is when you give your tokens for free, right? Because you're printing your own money. Why not give it for free, <laughs> right? So you don't give the US dollar away for free, but when you're printing your own money, why not give it away for free, right? <laughs> so, so, so that's an airdrop, right? So an airdrop is used as a means to do marketing. So when you do airdrop, you're basically doing marketing. And you don't have to actually airdrop the token. It can actually be an access token to something else. So, so coins are currencies that we saw, like Bitcoin, Ethereum can be actual currency. It can be a, a, it's something that you pay fees on the network. And the tokens could be assets, system utilities, tickets, so on and so forth, right? Coin and you know, tokens can fundamentally represent three different things, measure of value, medium of exchange, store of value, right? So, okay, I'm just going through this much faster. I mean, if you don't get some of these things, you have to stop me and ask me questions, right? It's an interaction, it's a conversation. So the substrate is the base protocol, right? I mean, Ethereum, for example, is substrate for most tokens, right? So all the tokens will have a substrate because your tokenomics will depend on the substrate, whether there's a fee, whether there's no fee, you know, are you paying the gas price or is everything free, right? So or your tokenomics will have to factor that in as well. The system is basically the system in which your tokens exist, which is your ecosystem that you're building. There are active tokens and passive tokens. So an active token is something that you actually use. A passive token could be an API. It could be an access token. It could be a INT card or something like that, right? Which you can, used to board a plane or, you know, so tokens are also being used for it. Like Tangem, which, uh, which Hugo has, could be an access uh, token, you know? So they built a, you know, crypto wallet. It's very thin crypto wallet. It's like a baseball card, which you can actually use to, you know, spend your crypto, but it can also be used as an access token, right? So, so and is the token supply fixed or is unlimited, right? Do you have a fixed supply or do you have an unlimited supply? So what is the difference between a fixed supply and a unlimited supply? Yes, it's nice, no? I mean, I'm hungry, I print some tokens, get some pizza, you know? But Yes, exactly, right? You know, quantitative easing. I mean, so there's a word for it as well. So it makes it look very scientific. You know, you don't have the money you don't have to sell T-bills, you can actually just print money, and it's called quantitative easing. So what is the problem with unlimited supply of tokens? There's no value, right? I mean, or, the, or we hope that there won't be any value. But do we have any case studies of tokens that are unlimited? Tontines? No? <laughs> Ethereum, yes. Ethereum, because Ethereum, every year, there's a lot of uh, Ethereum that get lost. And that's the excuse they give, right? Because then they can release new Ethereum Ether into the market. They say anywhere between one to five percent of the Ether get lost or gets locked up, you know, because people lose their private keys. And so they release Ethereum every year out in the market, right? So that's printing your own money, unlimited money supply. When you have limited money supply, what is the problem? Bitcoin is only 21 million uh, Bitcoins. But then what is the problem with limited money supply? Price will increase. So what will happen if the price increase? Transaction will increase. Okay, great. Uh, so very solid points. But what is the problem with limited money supply when you do tokenomics? Sorry? You end up with a lot of decimal points. Exactly. Because you have limited supply, so even a fraction of the coin becomes very useful, right? When I was trading bitcoins, I would buy 10, 15 bitcoins. And a lot of our friends here have seen my trade. And now I don't have the money to go buy, to buy 10, 15 bitcoins, right? Because a bitcoin itself is three and a half, four thousand dollars, right? And also some big, uh, some big token holders can actually manipulate the market. Manipulate the market, exactly, right? When your token supply is set. So, so the fundamental problem with the fixed token supply is that 
once you do it, once you put it on a smart contract, it's done, right? You cannot go and change it. You cannot just keep printing the tokens every now and then. Or you have to create a secondary token and then do a token swap and things which is very cumbersome. So there are challenges to both the fixed supply and the, and the uh, unlimited supply, right? So you need to really think about some of these things. So we'll get deeper into it as, uh, as the thing proceeds. I mean, it depends on how, whether you fall asleep or not as well. So there's something called as fungibility, right? So this is another thing that people keep talking about, fungible versus non-fungible token. So should security tokens be fungible or non-fungible? Fungible? OK. I mean, there are no right or wrong answers. Huh? I mean, it's just uh, there could be both, right? So anybody else? Should security tokens be fungible or non-fungible? What is fungible or? Non-fungible, right? Poker chips are identical, right? So it doesn't matter which poker chip. That means fungible. These are fungible. So one poker chip from another poker chip, you don't differentiate, right? It's one US dollar. It's the same. The number might be different. The smart contract address might be different, but they're still fungible. A non-fungible token is something that represents completely different tokens, right? CryptoKitties, for example, right? How many of you bought CryptoKitties here? Really? Nobody, all smart people here. Right? I mean, it's <laughs> unbelievable. <laughs> so, exactly, exactly. So, you know, the it's very important to understand this, right? Because a utility token can be fungible because it could represent the same value. Whereas when you securitize a share, there is a different folio number. And that folio number could represent a non-fungible token, right? Could be a unique token which could be non-fungible. But it depends on the asset class. It depends on what you're securitizing, right? So you can just build a ERC-20 token that'll you know, fractionalize the share and the shares might have the same value and then it can be traded. But if you have an actual share folio which you're tokenizing and then you're trading, that could be a non-fungible token, like ERC-721 or, or 1400 or whatever. So, so fungibility is an important thing to understand before you do a tokenomics uh, thing. So some tokens are transferable, some tokens are not, right? So so these are fungible transfer tokens. Some examples of fungible transfer tokens are cash, bus tickets. Non-fungible tokens are gym membership. Unless you look like the other person, right? You can't transfer the gym membership. I can't look like Jatain, he's half my size. <laughs> so if I go to his the gym, they won't let me in, all right? So, so, you know, these are some of the examples of, you know, so every token, the structure, defines how you model the economy of the token. So this is an important slide, right? So there's something called as a circular economy. You need to understand whether you're building a circular economy, a source to sink economy, right? Or a straight line back to the exchange. So what do I mean by a circular economy? So when I issue a token and the token gets used, right? And it comes back to me, that's a circular economy. There's a circle, right? The token is circulating within the economy. A source to sync token, once it's spent, it's burnt. You cannot use that token ever again, right? It's almost like an access token. You mint a finite amount of tokens, or you can just keep printing it, but it has only one use, right? Can you give more examples of a, a source to sync token? Any example of a source to sync token? Plastic, Plastic yes. <laughs> Any more examples? Sorry? Entrance ticket. Entrance ticket, yes. That's a source to sing. You use it once, it's destroyed, right? So each of these things determine the nature of the token economics, right? Whether it's a circular economy that you're looking to build, whether you're looking to build a source to sync token where the token's only used once, or a token which goes back to the exchange. A lot of these assets are going to be traded, right? So and then the exchange comes into play because you want the tokens to be traded. You're creating an aftermarket or a secondary market for your tokens. So exchange traded tokens are fundamentally different and the tokenomics for that is going to be different from having a real life use case where you use the token for doing something, for buying and selling stuff. Like some of the assets that you're collateralizing and securitizing on the, on the exchange, I mean, or which are going to be exchange traded, are different from the uh, circular economy and sourcing economy they need to be thought out in a very different way. 
and the tokenomics that you do for them also have to be, has to be different, right? Am I understandable or yes? Excellent. So you have tokens, tickets, passes, and coupons. They're all tokens, right? So a coupon could give you some kind of a discount. Like for example, when you airdrop uh, a coupon, you, what you're doing is you're giving a discount on the actual token. So if somebody buys the token on the ICO, they get a discount by using a coupon, right? So, and then you have tickets, which you can use for participating in events and so on, where you can get discounted tokens. So there are all kinds of it, right? E economics of each of them are different. So a payload is what, what the value of the token. What is the token carrying, right? What is the unit of value? Like for example, Digix gold token carries ownership of a gram of gold. So if you have the token, you can actually claim the ownership of a gram of gold. So each token is fundamentally different that way, right? The payload is different. So what kind of payload also determines the economy of the token, right? Are you going to claim the gold? Are you, are you going to you know, just use it for trading, right? So the payload really matters. And also divisibility, right? So how many of you have done an ICO here so far? Okay, excellent, excellent. A lot of experts here, fantastic. All our friends. So, Bitcoin has 21 million Bitcoins, right? But it's divisible by 18 decimal places, right? One Satoshi is, right? It's uh, 100 million Satoshi is one Bitcoin. And so the amount of divisibility, right, is also very important. How do you determine divisibility? Any formula methods anybody has used to determine the divisibility of a particular token? I see a standard 18 or five or six nominally but what, what makes people arrive at that number? Most of the people say, you know, I mean, a billion tokens. I have 100 million tokens and then make it divisible by three or four, and a billion tokens is okay. Right? So there has to be a more scientific method and we will get to it. How do you arrive at the number of tokens? How do you arrive at the number of decimals, which is a fraction of the token? All these things matter. Right? Because if you don't decide it the right way, then you know it's haywire, right? Ninety percent of tokens, you know, are, are trading below the ICO price. Right? I mean, of course a lot of them have not launched their product, but their tokenomics is also sort of, you know, haywire. So the monetary policy are two different things in a real economy. One is monetary policy, the other one is physical policy. We all know about it. Right? Governments, what what do they do? They increase interest rates, decrease interest rates, right? or create actual demand for their currencies, right? So, so that's monetary and physical policy. Just like monetary and physical policy in the real economy, there are two fundamental ways in which you can control your economy. So token monetary policy is controlling money supply, right? Which is price inflation, for example. So you have 21 million Bitcoins, right? That's a total money supply. And then there's price inflation. So how do you control that? Or Ethereum, for example, right? Ethereum has inflation where every year they have 15.6 15 .6 million uh, Ethereum that they launch out in the, uh, in the market to control their money supply, right? So what are the three different things that you can do? You can control the total number of tokens that are in supply. You can also do the second thing which a lot of people are not doing with ICO, right? Which is, they release all their tokens at one shot. You don't have to. Like let's say you have 10 million tokens, you don't have to release all of them in one shot. You can release them over a 10 year period, or a five year period, depending on how your economy is going to look like. But you need to model your economy in the first place to know how your economy is going to look, right? Do we all agree? No, yes, maybe. Because what happens when you release all the tokens at one shot? You crash the market, there's so much, too much supply, right? But if you only release a portion of the tokens out in the market and then put the rest of it in escrow and make it openly auditable and then you release it every year, then you control your money supply. This not a lot of people are doing, right? It's another interesting way to manage your money supply. And of course, uh, and then the third is the maximum issue of insurance of tokens is the total amount of tokens that are in supply. And that, you know, that's a number that you fix, right? So 
the physical policy is the demand side. That was the supply. How do you control supply? And this is the demand side, right? There's two sides of the equation, right? Demand and supply. So one of the ways that you can do this is by buying back tokens, right? But a lot of people do not have the money to buy back tokens. They have a treasury, typically 5 to 10% of the money that is raised is kept in treasury to stabilize the price of the tokens. So a lot of tokens, people buy back the tokens to stabilize the price. But that's a really bad idea because you actually want to create real demand for the tokens. You don't want to just keep playing the market physical policy, right? The second thing is selling tokens, right? Third one is market making. The market makers are making a ton of money. Any market makers here? Crypto market makers, right? They're making a ton of money. And then, of course, you pay your employees and everybody else using tokens. And that's a good way because if people believe in your tokens, they buy your tokens. And then there's a real demand for your tokens. And then you get to give grant tokens for certain activities, you know. And of course, the last one, which is the worst case scenario, is called burning tokens. What is burning tokens? What do I mean by burning tokens here? Anybody in the last bench? I want to see if who's awake, who's not awake. I have a very soothing voice, I'm told. I put people to sleep. What is burning tokens? Destroying the tokens, right? Because the tokens cannot be used. So when you burn the tokens, those tokens can no longer be used. So you're creating artificial scarcity, which is not the right methodology when you think about it. Because you need the tokens in the long term, right? You need the tokens in the long term. You rather put it in escrow or, or, or you freeze the tokens instead of burning them. So, but each of them depends on different scenarios and, and so on. So let me uh, get back to my storytelling, right? And we are now getting to more detailed valuations, values, economic models, formulas, and so on. But I want to wake you up by telling you a story. And uh, the story is about this American guy in New Jersey who wanted to get into the real estate space, right? He wanted to become a real estate tycoon in the 1920s, the 1920s. So this guy, this American guy, with a small amount of money that he had, about $200,000 that year, went to a remote village in New Jersey. And he went to the village and he wanted to buy the land and he bought 100 acres of land. But that 100 acres of land only had a value of $100,000. And to become a real estate tycoon, you need millions of dollars. So he said, I want to become a real estate tycoon. How do I, how do I make this happen? So what he did was that he went and told everybody in the village that he's building a car factory. This is, this is a very important, the morale of the story is very important for the crypto world. I spent 10 years thinking about this and I thought this is probably the best way to explain it, right? Because I was thinking about how do I explain it? So this guy went and told everybody in the village that he's building a car factory. So the mayor of the, of the town came and told him, you know, what can I do for you? He said, I need restaurants or no restaurants. You know, I need bars because I'm going to, you know, hire, uh, you know, uh, employees are going to come. They have to have a good time. And he said, there are no hotels here. You know, I mean, who's going to come to this place and work when there are no hotels? You know, and then he said, there are no marketing agencies. So every three weeks once he will, you know, post a demand. And he said, there's no universities, there are no colleges. So why don't you get a grant and, you know, open like a, you know, training center for this thing. Then he said, there are no tire repair companies. So, you know, this mayor started bringing everybody together. He started getting grants. He started hustling. Then a bank came and set up because the bank heard that there are going to be a lot of customers, you know, a lot of employees in the car factory. So in a period of six months, the whole town, you know, had new buildings. The land value had gone up, right? You see where I'm getting to. And after six months, the mayor went and said, so when do you, when do you plan on launching the factory? And he said, what factory are you talking about? <laughs> right? So he's, he meant, uh, you know, toy, uh, toy car factory or whatever. But the idea, the idea is when you look at the crypto world today, right, when you value the tokens, in the traditional world when you want to value an asset or a security, it is based on future dividends, right? The price of the share today is based on the PV is based on the future value for the dividends, right? So whereas here, there are no dividends. You're not paying any dividends. You have no rights in the company. The token is just a token. It is just a belief in Eric or, uh, you know, our friend from Kaos, right? So that's what it is. 
it gives you no rights. It's just like a US dollar bill. In God we trust. Right? So, in God we trust. If you can find God, you know, you can go and ask him what happened to the dollar. But until then, you know, you, can, you cannot do anything about it. So exactly that way, the crypto tokens are all based on this belief that there will be a car factory in New Jersey <laughs> and that will drive the prices up, right? So let's get deeper into it, right? Valuation is a factor of expectations. Bitcoin has increased in value from $900 to $1,300 over the last uh, year, right? And, and it fell back to, it went up to 19,500 something and then it fell back. You should buy it now before it goes up, right? Because only three and a half thousand dollars today. So there's something called as efficient market theory, which says that the best predictor of tomorrow's price is today's price, right? So put it another way, right? So P of T is E of P T plus one, which is basically there's an arbitrage op opportunity, right? That the price is heavily dependent on the expectation and the arrival of new information, right? So the price is based on the information and the whole market is based on all these news releases, press releases that are coming out, saying that you know this guy said this, that guy said that, he's gonna do this. But eventually what happens? Nothing happens. Okay, so now we get into the more details of designing a, a token economy. You're creating your own microeconomy, right? So there's something called as quantity theory of money, right? Where money supply is M, price of the tokens is P, it's a very standard equation. T is the total number of tokens transacted per day. V is the velocity of tokens and D is the dollar value. The QTM is an accounting identity which says T is equal to MV. T is the total number of tokens is equal to the total money supply into the velocity of the tokens. The velocity is the speed in which the tokens get traded. It's very important, right? Token velocity is important. Is velocity important or is volume important? Which is important? Why? What is the problem if velocity is high? They hold on to the coin, right? So if the velocity is too high, they will, hold, will they hold on to the coin? Or will they not hold on to the coin? They'll not hold on to the coin. If the volume is high, what happens? They will hold on to it? They won't hold on to it. So which is good? Which is good depends on what kind of economy it is. In certain economies, you want money circulation, right? You want tokens to be traded. Like for example, I'm buying and selling. If the token is a medium of exchange, I want to have high velocity because I want the tokens to be traded. I want the price to be stable. Whereas, whereas like let's say, I'm doing a security. I don't want the security to be traded like crazy, right? Or like let's say it's an access token where I don't want the token price to fluctuate like crazy. So it all depends, but both are good answers, right? I mean, we want to think about these things. So for example, if there are 100 tokens that each day trades two times, right? Then the total, velo total volume is 200 tokens, which will be traded, right? So let's look at the assumption of a GOAT token. So let's say I've created a token that's backed by GOAT. I want to buy and sell GOAT, right? Okay. So if we need to use 100 GOAT tokens to buy and sell 800 GOATs, right? And tokens have a velocity of two. So velocity is basically two today. Then each token must be worth four GOATs. Simple model, arriving at price of the token. Total number of tokens, the amount of times the tokens will be traded, right? as a determin determination of the price of the token. But how do people derive price of the token? How do they do it? Today? Sorry? No, it's out of thin air. He saw that in some other white paper. He just copy pasted that, right? There is no determination, right? So I would have grilled at least half a dozen people in Singapore and the US. Most of the time it's a random number. It's a random number. It is not based on any meaningful mathematical model. I mean, this is a very simple model. You have, I'm selling goats. There's nothing more simpler than selling, <laughs> selling goats, right? So when I advise some of my projects, that's what I tell them. You're buying and selling goats, 
we need to use 100 goat tokens to buy and sell 800 goats. We have 800 goats today. We are going to have 100 goat tokens to sell them. And tokens have a velocity of two. Then each token is worth four goats. Simple. So velocity is based on your pretty, you know, imagination of how it's going to be and you know, depending on your future prediction of your product, your service, or whatever you offer. So, but you, know, you can also use the velocity in the model, right? T is equal to mv, so v is equal to t by m. So if you have t and m, you can predict the v, right? So d by p is equal to mv, so p is equal to d by mv, or v is equal to d m, pm by d. So if you have one or two of these variables that you know, then you can actually model the entire ecosystem. You can model the money supply, you can model the velocity, you can model, of course, based on certain assumptions that you have about your product or service. It cannot be out of thin air, right? I mean, so it's based on initial assumptions of, but it cannot be a random number from another white paper. So it's a good question. Another question. Correct. No, absolutely, absolutely. That's what it is. So, what I'm talking about here is the initial valuation of the token in an ICO, and which will also determine future value, the volume, the velocity, and all that stuff. And a price signaling is very important because market does price signaling, right? It's based on information and all that stuff. But let's hope that there is a real use case for the utility token, and then, then there is, uh, it's not just speculation of the, of the tokens are getting traded. So, all right, so what we have here is uh, value drivers of a token, right? So we're getting on to interesting question, and the next slide basically talks about the, the question, right? So the demand to support certain value of transactions per day, right? So it's very important that the token has to do it. It has to support the velocity. It has to support the, uh, the number of tokens that are out there, right? So transaction demand is decided by users. You cannot decide the transaction demand, right? It's based on how much the users want to buy and sell the product. So you need to somehow model it based on certain assumptions. The more the user, the greater the value, right? So as more and more users get on board, they start using the, the tokens, so hence the um, the, the volume of the tokens will go up, so you need to facilitate that. The velocity is also determined by user choice, right? How our platform can be designed to slow down velocity, and we know how to do it, right? By to manipulating, managing the token price, by buying tokens, and so on. So these are things that, I don't know, is this, will this go down there? So you can either observe or try to estimate, right? Based on certain numbers, but these have to be meaningful numbers. It cannot be a random, correlation, right? So we will, there's a session I'm looking to do specifically on something called the Monte Carlo simulations, on simulating different futures. And there's a French uh, thing called scenario planning, which I learned in, uh, in, in Europe. The French use, uh, the management consultants use. Uh, so we'll also look at scenario planning models to predict some of the future demands. Very systematic way of looking at token price, you know, instead of putting in random numbers. So these are allocations, so this is typically, you know, what people use for the burnt and unburnt tokens, some good examples of token allocations that I've seen so far, but of course it varies from project to project, right? So, so some projects, the founders have 40, 50%, and then you, what do you do with a project like that? When founders have 40% of your tokens, you run far away from the project, right? <laughs> you run far away, <laughs> so, so, you need to have a clear monetary policy before you decide all these things, right? So, so stage your offering, go for 10 million or less in this market. Don't raise like 50 or 100 million. As one of our mutual friends, Eric's friend and I, uh, we don't want to name the person, but he want to raise 200 million. And that'll basically drive the investor away. He'll get, the investor will be scared. So have a meaningful number, make sure all the documents you have are legal, Right? The money you're printing yourself, but the documents cannot also be printed by yourself. It has to be a legal entity. You have deep discounts, means desperation. So don't give 50, 60, 70% discounts in this market. So it's very important to have a serious responsibility for a token holder, right? So this is the first part of it. 
The second part is the base layer protocol. But I wanted to take a break before, because we're getting into deeper game theory models and so on. Uh, I want to take a short break uh, to understand what you thought about this so far. Was this interesting? Are there any questions? Yes. You know, I'm, we, our fund, the Genesis blog, gets 40 white papers a day, right? And uh, we see this, I mean, you see this for 10 years, it's almost like going mad. Because you see all kinds, it's like a circus out there. You know, so there, there's no scientific, you know, methodology that's being used when you can actually use some of these formulas to arrive at meaningful numbers for each of these things. Total supply, volume, velocity, you know, using meaningful uh, numbers to do, you know, uh, uh, price uh, management, you know, price arbitrages. So there are very scientific models that you can use to do some of these things. But people are just doing it in random. And uh, and so I think that's why, you know, I wanted to go step by step, make it simple for people to understand. Uh, so any other questions so far from? Yes. No, it's not for security, it's for utility tokens. So I have a separate model for security tokens. Sorry? Yeah, I mean, it's one of the models to look at, you know, in a mean, instead of coming up with a random number, right? It's one of the ways to say that this could be a way to look at it. A security is fundamentally different because it represents a real world asset. So I have three sections right now in the presentation. The first one is a utility token where we have, you know, the theory of money, where we talk about it. The second aspect is the game theory models for managing protocols. When you have a protocol because you have to incentivize users in a system. And the third one is when you have a real world asset. That's almost like corporate finance, right? You have capital asset pricing model, you have net present value in total rate of return, you know, and so on and so forth. But it also has an element of crypto because this has to be traded in a secondary market. So you have volume, velocity, and so on. So if you want to take the question about security tokens, it's another section. Yes. Yes, correct. Yes. Yeah. Right. 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 No, it's a very good point that you made, right? I mean, so you're looking at a real world currency which has much higher volume, it has much higher velocity, uh, it's backed by a Federal Reserve government, so there's also a trust factor and all of that. So how do you use this? Because of the simple fact that the space is very new, that there's hardly any new publication that's come out which looks at utility token modeling and hence a lot of people have been following this. But this is a good point to start with when you have nothing to start with. Instead of coming with a random number, say one cent per token or five cents per token or 50 million tokens in circulation, you come out and say that this is how my future is going to look and hence I want to start you know, from there you know, to support my volume and velocity. Eric. Right, right, right. One, two, three. Three questions. Yes. Is this is this related to the or yes. Right. Right. 
Right. Correct. Exactly. Exactly. Right. So, <laughs> so there's another question in the back, uh, and then I'll come to you. Yes. Yes. Correct. So, you know, these are all very important questions, right? So I keep seeing this on the field every day. And, and the problem there is that there are no meaningful models to do this, right? So a lot of people are, like, let's say, doing a payment service, right? They're building a payment token for cross-border payment. But they've never done payments before. So, you know, they come up with a random number. So unless you're a subject matter expert and you have enough data, right? Or you look at, like, let's say, I mean, some people look at Visa and MasterCard and they say they're doing, like, you know, 10 million transactions per day. I mean, you're never going to be able to do it. So, you know, you have to come up with some kind of a rational argument to say that, you know, this is the amount of goats I'm going to buy, this is the amount of goats I'm going to sell, this is the volume, this is the velocity, and, and hence this thing. It's very hard, it's very hard, yeah. And that's why 90% of tokens are going to zero, because there is very limited data. So you, they need to have a real data set, they need to have a data model, they'll have to do simulations. Um, correct. Correct. So it's like net percent value, right? When you do a startup, what you do is you do NPV. You say my discounted cash flow is going to be like this for the next five, six years, and then do it. Right. 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 Correct. Correct. So I mean, you know, these are all, there are no easy answers to any of these questions, which also is very exciting because it's a new field, which basically means new models can come. New papers can be published, right, when you, based on what you see in the field and, and, and so on. So there's one more question I will take here, and then there's one more here. Yes. How is the price differentiation affected by the different amounts of Right. So this is the, this is the ICO price, right? So on, on the ICO price, you, you know, typically give a discount, right, depending on how desperate you are. Like, for example, if you take Definity, uh, Definity they gave like a 1%, 2% discount or 5% discount or something like that, and people are desperate to get into it. So it depends on the technology you're building. If it's a technology that, you know, it's the barrier to entry is low, then you're very desperate for money, and then you give a 50%, 60% discount on the token. Typically what happens is that there's no lock-in period. So typically they go dump the token, and the token goes to zero, and 90% of tokens trading in coin market cap. There's somebody from coin market cap today. Where is the gentleman from coin market cap? All right. So, I mean, he probably has the statistics, right? But almost 80, 90 percent of the tokens are trading below the ICO price. Would I be correct when I say this? Uh, right. Okay. <laughs> He's very diplomatic. <laughs> so, but this is a real problem. It's a real problem, right? So, and then who else do we have? You have here and then that one there. Yes. 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 Right. Yes. So this is the beauty of the crypto space. Everybody is unemployed, so we can do whatever we <laughs> want to do. <laughs> right? so, you know, we can theorize, do whatever we want to do. Right? On a Monday afternoon, you know, the room is full. So, <laughs> so, so, but it's it's a good point. I mean, there's so many different models. I mean. I mean, you can, you know, you can think about the token as an option and use black shoals to model the token if you want. I mean, you can provide an option on the token if you want to. But, of course, MAs will come and come knocking on the door. Uh, is Jonathan there? Is Jonathan still awake? Yes. So, yes, there's two more questions. Yes, Eric. Yeah. Yes. Like yes. Right. Yes. No, absolutely. And you know what I'm seeing in the market now also, you know, I'm part of Genesis Block, a crypto fund in New York. A lot of them are not investing just in tokens. They're also taking equity. And when you do equity, you want to have fair market valuation of your shares. 
And how do you arrive at a fair market value of your shares? It's based on net present value internal rate of return, or something like a capital asset pricing model, or so on and so forth. So, but it's an interesting area to investigate further because as she was saying, I mean, how do you use like, you know, a currency which has a much higher volume velocity, it's backed by something else, to something like a token which only exists within an ecosystem, right? So, yes. Right. No, absolutely, absolutely. And it's also based on the amount of capital you have, your unit economics, and so on and so forth. I mean, there's so many different dimensions to it. So it's a good point. Yes. Yeah, because, you know, if you do a discount, it's going to be on the books, it's going to be on the P&L, right? So that's what people don't realize. A discount's not out of thin air. It's all still part of the P&L. It has to be in the balance sheet somewhere, right? So that's another good point. Sikai. Very good point. So what we are seeing also now in the market is Dutch auctions. A lot of people are doing Dutch auctions because it's price discovery, right? You see, you know, tons of uh, projects are now coming out and saying the initial coin offering is based on an auction. And so it's a very good point, by the way. So any more questions? Yes. Two questions. Yes. 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 Correct. Absolutely. It's a very, very good point because, you know, I think Runa would uh, look into it because Runa runs an exchange here called COS. I think one of the top exchanges in Singapore. And he would have seen, I think, companies which have ra actually raised money and built a product, which have real utility, probably has a far greater value of their tokens than something that's speculating. This is the unfortunate thing in the market as well, right? A lot of people have done ICOs with the white paper. They're not entrepreneurs. It takes them two years to build a product. And in the meantime, it's all you have. The value of the token is speculative value. It is based on the, this is why I gave the example of the car and the real estate guy, <laughs> so that you never forget it, right? The story is such a story that nobody would forget it, yes. Right, right. 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 Yes. Right. No, I agree with you. I agree with you. So I think what, what we need is a new model, which will look at the product, it will look at the feature, look at the functionality, look at extraneous variables like news, information, so on. But, you know, how are you going to model it, right? I mean, what kind of a model will it look like? What is it going to be some sort of a Monte Carlo model? Is it going to be you know, a partial differential equation will look at, you know, 30, 40 different variables. You know, beyond a point, you want to have a model where you can have some control over, right? Because you cannot control the entire universe as well. So these are some of the things that we've been thinking about because, you know, we've done 40 ACOs so far and, you know, looked at close to 700 white papers and it's very hard to actually predict the future. But I agree with what you're saying, which you're reinstating, which I think is there needs to be more science and more math in this field. And I hope you will do it and publish some papers on it. And then, fantastic, fantastic. Yes, Runa. Yes. 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 Right. Correct. Exactly, exactly. Right. Yes. So this was a painful lesson learned. So this is the story of one of the first ICOs from Singapore, 
which was called Amber, A-M-M-B-R dot com. 2016, December, they didn't do a public sale, they did a private sale. So they were smart, they didn't want to release the product, so I was part of the project. They didn't want to release the token into the public market before they had pilots. So the US government, uh, US Army, wanted to buy these wireless mesh networks, which they were building, so it's a token-based system. You put the Amber wireless router in the village, the whole village will have access to internet, banking, self-sovereign identities, and so on. So it's a you know wireless mesh token-based access system. So when they did the pilot, they launched the token in Coin Super, and and then they realized they needed more capital. So then they took the token out of circulation, and are doing an actual ICO right now. After two years of doing the you know private sale, and the tokens are locked in, so the investors were impatient because you cannot meaningfully expect an investor to wait for two years, because the risk-free return in a lot of markets is about seven eight percent. I mean, if you know a little bit of investing, you make fifteen percent in markets. I mean. Right. Correct. Exactly. Exactly. It doesn't make any sense. Correct. 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 No, it could be a second token which will give access to this token on a discount or a bonus or something like that. That's the only way to do it. Because if you actually do the token, it doesn't make any sense at all. And it's a very good point uh, that you made. Uh, so any more questions before we go to the next one? Or are we all good? Okay, excellent. I think this is very interesting because there's a lot of information from the, the audience. And uh, there are a lot of gurus uh, right here. <laughs> so, this is fantastic.